any day a sound will be made that's never been heard before and when it's made it will burst open the grave of everyone that went to sleep in the that remain in a moment will be changed with the brightness of heaven all around there'll be praise there'll be singing heaven's bells will be ringing when that cloud starts coming On this cloud will be our Savior, King of kings, Lord of lords, God's Son, rising up His church to join Him. Oh, hallelujah, eternity. when his glorious church leaves the sinful world and goes home to the place he's prepared fire and brimstone will rain on everything that remains and the fire will fill the very are saved will have done left their grave glorified robed in white gone home where we'll praise him forever in a land where night comes never when his glorious church goes on on this cloud will be our Savior, King of kings, Lord of lords, God's Son, rising up His church to join Him. Oh, hallelujah, eternity has Matthew chapter 24, could not get away from uh, the thought this morning, and I'm just going to continue on just a little ways, if the Lord will allow us to, just got a few uh, things tonight uh, that I want to bring to your attention. I don't believe it'd be anything new, but I tell you what, it's the Word of God, and we need it, and uh, certainly the coming of the Lord as we dealt with this morning, of course, we're all going to be changed, and uh, whether folks are saved or whether they're lost, a change that's going to change everybody as we dealt with this morning out of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. But tonight out of Matthew 24, I'm going to read a couple different places here in chapter 24. But those that can and will, if you're able to, if you found your place, if you would stand with us tonight in honor and reverence to the reading of God's holy and undefiled word. Tonight, Matthew 24, I want to begin reading in verse 3. And then we're going to drop down just a little ways. Verse number 3 comes with a question. The Bible said there in Matthew 24 and verse 3, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Now here the disciples have made this uh, question here, and they've asked it, but now notice in verse number 36. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. 
But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark. And knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Let's pray together. Fathers, we come to you. Lord, this morning, God, we want to say thank you, Lord, for the blessings. Lord, just the privilege to pray. Thank you, Lord, for this great day, the beautiful weather you've given to us outside. And thank you, Lord, for the folks that have came out on this Lord's Day, the evening service. And I pray, Lord, that you'd bless them for their efforts of being here. Now, God, I realize I cannot help them. No man can help them, but I know you can. And I pray that your word would find a great lodging place, Lord, in the hearts of your people. I pray, Lord, that you'd just uh, challenge us, God, tonight, change us forever. And, Father, if there's one in the midst and one listening down the road to this uh, a message somewhere up by CD, Lord, I ask, God, if they're lost, I pray that you'd save them this very day. We know that it's your will that not any should perish, but God may you just light a fire under us, Lord, to be a people that's busy about your work, realizing, God, what's going to befall this world one of these days. God, help us to be ready. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for that precious blood, God, that was shed. I thank you for the resurrection, and thank you, Lord, for the promise that you're coming again one of these days. God, help us to be faithful. Help us to be good stewards of what you've given us, and God, we'll thank you, and we'll praise you for what you do, for we ask it in Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, Amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated here out of Matthew 24, of course, verse number 3. Again, they asked the question. I want to go back. Of course, these fellows, uh, they had left all and and had followed the Lord Jesus Christ. At this particular time, they, they didn't understand. They didn't understand that Jesus was going to return. They actually thought that Jesus Christ was going to sit up an earthly literal reign there in Jerusalem, and they was wondering when that time was going to come. And they asked that question. They said, uh, there tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the world? And then we go down, and of course, I believe there was one particular time uh, since I've been here that I preached on the days of Noah. Now, this one's going to be just a little bit different, but tonight I want to focus in on the coming of Christ. And understand this, that preceding, before Jesus Christ returns, you can characterize this world by several different ways. And of course, here we just read this text, but of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels in of heaven, but my Father only, but as the days of Noah were. We go back into the book of Genesis and you can see uh, the things that were going on in Noah's day is going to be going on right before Jesus Christ comes again. Now, of course, we'll look at the scoffers here in just a moment, but there's folks that would literally laugh us right in front of our face and would say, do you believe that? Do you really believe that Jesus is coming again? And that is a great question. Because I, somebody done a survey, and this was done in 2007, 62% of fundamental Bible-believing Christians, 62% only, believe that Jesus is really coming again. 62%. Now that's 2007, and who knows? They didn't poll me. Probably didn't poll. I don't know who they polled. But understand this. That if that is fact, that means that there's folks that are sitting in our church houses today and they really, they've heard it their whole life, but in the back of it, they don't really believe that Jesus is going to come again. As I made that statement this morning, regardless if I believe it, regardless if you believe it, honey, God said He was coming again and He's going to come one day. Now, there is some, I believe there is some some weight to that study that was come out 62%. Because the people that don't believe that Jesus is coming again ain't going to be too busy in the work of the Lord. Because if you don't believe Jesus is coming again, friend, you've got to understand tonight, if we believe that He's coming, and there's some folks that would tell me, they say, oh yeah, preacher, I believe Jesus is coming again. But in the back of their mind, they really don't believe He's coming because if they did, they wouldn't do the things that they were doing. We've got to understand. We're all going to stand before God one of these days and understand this, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ is real. I mean, it's as real as it's ever been. Paul was looking for Christians 100 years ago, 50 years ago. My grandpa and so on and so forth back yonder, they were looking for Jesus and he ain't come, but he still has not changed his mind. He's going to come in an hour when we think not. Now notice here, what, is it, what will these days be characterized by? Well, it'll be uncertain times. There'll be some uncertainty. 
Again in verse 36 it says, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Now there's no way that we can pinpoint, again I'm going to reiterate this again, there's no way that we can pinpoint the day or the hour when Jesus is going to come again. There's those that have tried and they have failed. They will be those if the Lord tarries that will try it again and they too will fail. How do you know that preacher? Because it's uncertain when he's going to come. The Bible makes it very clear. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. We can't be any more clear than that. And it's going to be uncertain times. We don't know when he's going to come. But we believe in the imminent return of Christ. Here's the thing. You know what people would do if they knew exactly when Jesus would return. Man, they'd live like the devil right up until the last hour. But we can't do that. Because we don't know when he's coming. But we do know this. He is coming one of these days. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I'm going to read a couple verses to you. 1 Corinthians, excuse me, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 1. He said, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that are right unto you. Now, there's a lot of folks that get caught up. They want to know the times and they want to know the signs. Well, here's your sign. Jesus is coming again. That's the sign that he gives us. We're not to be looking for times and seasons. As verse 2 of that text said, For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Now who knows when a thief's coming? You don't know when he's coming. If you knew when he was coming, you'd make preparations. If you've ever had your house broken into, and we have. Man, that's a bad feeling coming in, and the door standing wide open, and folks, somebody's come in, a stranger into your house, and has stole what you've got. I mean, it's a bad feeling. But... If we'd have known, Brother Cameron, if we'd have known in the precise hour that thief was coming, if he'd announced and said, hey, I'm coming, you know, tomorrow at 8 o'clock in the morning, we'd make sure, we'd make preparations that we were there. We would guard that house with our life knowing that the thief would come. But that's not how a thief operates. That's not how the coming of the Lord is going to operate because he's not a thief, but he's going to come like a thief in the sense that we don't know when he's coming. But verse 3 says this. For when they, who's that? That's the unbelievers. For when they shall say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. That verse there talking about the woman travail with child. You know how a, a, a lady will carry the baby, and you, you might have a certain date that the baby's supposed to be do, born, but man, when that time comes, I mean, you know without a doubt that's, that's when it comes out. I mean, you can say, well, it's going to be born. Gracie was born a month early. Of course, she was taken by Cesare. But if nature takes its course, most time the young is going to come out whenever. But it's sudden, it's instant, and you can't say, well, listen, we need to wait a week or two. No, that ain't the way it works. It comes right then. That's exactly the way the coming of the Lord is going to be. Uncertain times. Matthew chapter 24 in this text that we're reading there in some preceding, actually in some verses after that, in verse 42, notice what it said to Matthew 24 and verse 42. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. So he tells us, he gives us the, the, the encouragement and the admonition to watch, to be sober, to be vigilant, to be watching, to be alert, not asleep. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come, but know this. But if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. The hour when we think that he's not coming, that's when he's going to come. You see, the coming of Christ, again, it's a mystery. First, first uh, uh, Corinthians 15, we looked this morning at how the, the body's going to be changed. It is a mystery that was hidden in the Old Testament. Folks, we've been given 66 books of the Word of God here in the King James Bible. God has laid this thing out, and it should not take a believer by surprise. But we need to be reminded from time to time. And here's what happens. People have got so gospel-hardened. They've got so judgment-hardened. They've heard hell in this area. And, man, it don't scare them. It don't faze them anymore, even the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. But, again, I go back to 2 Corinthians. 
Corinthians chapter 5 in verse number 11 Paul said knowing therefore the terror of the Lord we persuade men all we can do uh, uh, brother uh, Leroy is just encourage them to get saved all we can do is encourage them to live for the Lord Jesus Christ while we've still been given that time and opportunity hey God may take me out of here tonight he may take you out of here tonight we may have 20 more years we may have 30 more years but understand this there's something etched on God's counter he knows when the last one's going to get in and there's going to come a sound out of heaven that trumpet in the church is going up and honey you better be ready your friends and family better be ready because after the he comes and takes the bride of Christ out that will usher in the seven year tribulation and you don't want to be left behind and they don't want to be left behind and we ought to work our tails off trying to win them to the Lord Jesus Christ if we believe he's coming we ought to roll up our sleeves and work but understand Kat, this the coming of the Lord, the time is going to be characterized by uncertainty. Nobody knows when He's coming, but He is coming in an hour when we think not. It will also be a, a time characterized by unpreparedness. Now, think about this. Look at this text here we read in Matthew 24. We've seen in verse 36, But of that day and hour knoweth no man. There's the uncertainty. But look at verse 37. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. Now there's nothing wrong here with, 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 with marrying and eating and things of that nature. That's not the point. The point is they were unprepared. They were unprepared until the waters came in the days of Noah. And we'll go over there to Genesis chapter 7 here in just a second. But think about this. People were living their life with no thought of tomorrow or eternity. Sad to say, there's many that do that in our day. They have no thought about tomorrow. They have no plans for eternity. Man, they plan for retirement. They plan for vacation. They plan for education. They plan for their school. They, they plan everything out. But a lot of times they leave the most important thing out. And that's their relationship with Jesus Christ. And understand, folks are going to be called unprepared just like they were in the days of Noah. And I give this to you quite often, but understand this. This is so important. Nobody's going to just stumble into heaven. They're going to have to have a conscious decision when the Holy Spirit of God deals with that heart. They're going to have to trust Him, repent of their sins, and get saved. Because heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people. How many times have you heard me say that? But Jesus said in John 14, He said, Let not your hearts be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there ye may be also. He's gone to prepare a place for a prepared people. How can we prepare, preacher? By knowing Jesus Christ. A lot of folks say, man, it's too easy. Salvation is one of the easiest things there is. <laughs> In our mindset, we work to get paid. We toil and we labor to reap the benefits when it comes to salvation for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves it's the gift of God folks can't grasp that it's too easy listen Jesus bore our sin bore our shame on Calvary's cross and he did make it easy for us to be saved and the Bible said there in the book of Hebrews I believe it's chapter 2 and about verse number 3 said how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation the salvation that God has offered, and it's free to whosoever will. And when a person trusts Christ, yes, they're prepared for eternity, but many, again, it will be characterized as it was in the days of Noah. It was uncertain. They didn't know the day. They didn't know the hour. And they were called unprepared. They were eating. They were drinking. They were marrying and giving in marriage, doing the things that everybody does still today, but they had not prepared for judgment that was coming. Understand this as we read on in this last verse of chapter 24 and verse 39. It said, And they knew not until the flood came, took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. It was uncertain. They didn't know when He was coming. They didn't know when the flood was coming as in the days of Noah. We don't know when Jesus is coming. The Bible said there's many going to be running around eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage. They were called unprepared. It'll be the same way in our day. 
But understand this, before Jesus comes again, these folks, the Bible said there, they knew not until the flood came and took them all away. It'll be characterized by unbelief. Because they heard in Noah's day, they heard, and I'm going to show you why. I want you to turn with me to the book of Genesis chapter 7. Genesis chapter 7. Say, preacher, why will it be characterized by a day of unbelief? Well, in Noah's day, understand this. If you read Genesis chapter 7, you'll find that Noah found grace in the eyes of God. Now, he was a man that God had saw, and he was a great man for his generation. And understand this, they saw him for those hundred years or so, building that ark faithfully every day, a good steward of what God had given him. Man, they had never even seen rain at this particular time. And God had told him, he said, look, there's a flood coming. And we know that he began to build the ark, but if we didn't have Second Peter, we wouldn't know that old Noah was a preacher of righteousness. But the Bible said this in Second, and I'm coming back to Genesis 7, but in Second Peter chapter 2 and verse 5, and God was talking about the judgments there, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Understand, before the flood ever came, Noah, by his life and by his message, trying to get people prepared, there was only eight of them that survived. The Bible makes that very clear. But they had heard, and yes, it'll be a time as the days of Noah, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. It'll be a time of uncertainty. We don't know when he's coming. It'll be a time of unpreparedness because people will run around to and fro, not making plans for eternity. But it'll be a time of unbelief because I promise you this, we've never had technology like we have today. We've got the internet. We've got CDs. You used to have tapes. You used to have uh, the, uh, the eight track or whatever that was. Man, it just seems like technology just keeps going bigger and better and better. We've got the internet internet we can go all over the world in just a few seconds preaching and proclaiming the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and as it was in the days of Noah there's folks that's going to reject and it's going to be characterized by unbelief it's the same in the day and hour in which we live Genesis 7 verse number 14 notice what it says well look at verse 13 in the self same day entered Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth, the sons of Noah and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with them into the ark. They and every beast after his kind and all the cattle, after their kind and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, after his kind and every fowl, after his kind, every bird of every sort. And they went in unto Noah into the ark, two and two of all flesh wherein the breadth of life. And they that went in, went in male and female of all flesh, as God had commanded him. Now watch this. And the Lord shut him in. Noah didn't shut the door to the ark. Ham didn't shut the door. Japheth. The one that shut that door, the Bible said the Lord shut him in. Look at verse 17. And the flood was forty days upon the earth. The waters increased and bare up the ark, and it was lifted up above the earth and the waters prevailed and were increased greatly upon the earth and the ark went upon the face of the waters and the waters prevailed, prevailed exceedingly upon the earth and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered 15 cubits upward did the waters prevail and the mountains were covered and all flesh died that moved upon the earth both of fowl and of cattle and of beasts and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth and every man all in whose nostrils was the breath of life. Of all that was in the dry land died. Preacher, why you say this will be the days of Noah was characterized by unbelief? Because they had a faithful witness in that day. Mark this down. God's going to have a faithful witness in every age. In the age we're living today, God is working through the church. He's working through the church house. And listen, there's folks that say, oh, the church is going down. Honey, the church ain't going down. The church is going up. Some, so, some say, well, the church is going to sink. It's going to drown. It can't drown. You say, hey, you know, preacher, honey, our head is in heaven. Jesus is the head of the church. So we can't go down. We've got to be faithful. 
We've got to be faithful. We've got to be good stewards. We've got to be expecting that Jesus is going to return. But we don't just sit down in a corner and rub our hands and say, Oh, come, come quickly, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Listen, we ought to be busy about the Father's work in the day and the hour in which we live because make the most of the opportunities. I can't go back to yesterday and you can't either. I can't go back 20 years and you can't either. That's why I always get on our kids. I don't make our older our older congregation, I don't mean to make you feel bad, but I try to get on our young folks sometimes, give God your best while you're young. Don't wait till you get wore out. Don't wait till you can't get up and do like you used to do because you can't get those times and those opportunities back. And we don't know what tomorrow's I'm glad I know who holds tomorrow, but we don't know what tomorrow's going to be. If we're going to do anything for God, we better do it today. Don't say, well, I'll do it next week or next month or next year. We better do it when God gives us the opportunity to do it. But this time frame was characterized by unbelief because they, as in our day, folks have heard the message. You could classify you, well, you could say, well, they've just got gospel hard and I don't know what holds them back. But I know this, it'll be a day that's characterized by unbelief. And know this. 2 Peter chapter 3, I told you I was going to get to the scoffers, and I'm about done. But 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 3 and 4 says, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers. Well, what is a scoffer? Well, listen. Walking after their own lust and saying, Where is the promise of His coming? In the days in which we're living, there's some that will say, You folks are crazy. You believe He's coming. Where is the promise of His coming? Man, we've heard that for 20, we've heard that for 100 years, and He ain't come back yet. There'll be scoffers, and there's scoffers in our days. And those are the folks that, with a spirit of unbelief, they don't believe. Although we try to tell them, we try to point the way, there's going to come a time as, as travail upon a woman with child, suddenness and swiftness, Jesus is going to return. Bride of Christ is going to go home. As we look this morning out of Second Thessalonians, those that are left that have heard the gospel message, God's going to send, the Bible says God's going to send them strong delusions that they believe a lie, so that they're all damned. That's what the Bible said in Second Thessalonians chapter two, and First Thessalonians chapter two. Excuse me, Second Thessalonians chapter two. In that particular text, you'll find that unfolding. But understand this: as it was in the days of Noah. The Bible said the Lord shut the door. I preached a message one time that wasn't down here. But I preached a message one time the family that everybody laughed at. Think about Noah. There's only eight of them that were left. Second Peter chapter 2 said he was a preacher of righteousness. They heard the truth. They were living in uncertain times. They didn't know. God said, hey, there's a flood coming. Noah was faithful. With what he had been given, he was a good steward of what he had. He believed God. Started building that ark. It was a time of unpreparedness in Noah's day. They were going around eating and drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, just just going through life, never preparing for eternity. Then it was an hour of unbelief. Those folks didn't believe Noah. They had never even seen Noah at all. I mean, they'd never seen rain. I can just see them going by as these building. They was probably wagging her head and laughing and laughing and laughing at Noah. But I promise you this, when the rain descended and the Bible said that the, the rain or, or the, the great fountains of the deep were broke, hey, it was coming from above and coming from underneath. And when that took place and the Lord shut the door, that laughing stopped. They were a family that everybody laughed at. Oh, there's, there's folks that will make fun of us. We ought not get mad at those folks because here, p- people that don't believe, how can we expect anything out of a lost man or a woman? A lot of folks don't know how to act. They show disrespect toward folks that are saved and born again. Now, what we don't need to do is show, show recompense evil for evil. We don't need to do that. But understand this, we've got the message. That got folks threw in jail in the book of Acts. They said, hey, boy, these fellows that have turned the world upside down, they came here too. We've got the message that will turn the world upside down. We've got to be faithful with us. What does God tell us to do? He tells us to get saved first. If you're here tonight and you're saved, to God be the glory. But after we saved, what are we doing? 
with what we've been given. God said to be alert, to be ready to watch. While we're here, God has entrusted us with things. We're to be good stewards of what God has blessed us with. With our time, our talent, and our treasure. All those things that God gives us. We're stewards of that. And God's going to call us into account one day. Have we been faithful? God calls us to faithfulness in these days. There's many that are throwing in the white towel of Christian service. Saying it ain't necessary. It ain't needed. It is needed. God said we're the salt. We're the light of the earth. But understand, when Jesus comes to get the church, that salt, that influence... The light, that influence, and he, remember the restrainer we talked about this morning, the Holy Spirit of God that indwells believers. At that moment when Jesus comes again, man, you're talking about complete lawlessness. That's what's going to be on the face of this planet. Do we need any more motivation to win men, women, boys, and girls of the Lord Jesus Christ? Do we need any more motivation? If a person dies without God, they're going to die and they're going to go to hell. I mean, that's boy, that won't make a person jump up and shout, but it's the truth. And you shall know the truth, the Bible said, and the truth shall make you free. But the truth can't make you free until you know it. And I hate to keep beating on this wagon, but man, you know what really gripes me? I mean, really gets under my craw. Is when I go to a funeral, and folks that claim to be preachers of the gospel stand up and no mention of Jesus, no mention of salvation, that burns me up. And I think about the blood Listen, of all the things that I, I do run, listen, I'm, again, I'm nothing apart from Jesus Christ. But understand this, we have nothing else to preach other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And I don't want no blood on my hands when I, listen, I'm going to have to answer for a lot, I know that. But I won't, don't want blood on my hands. And somebody say, you never told me how I could be prepared to meet God one day. Because we can be prepared. Listen, if you go through life and you don't ever know me, you ain't lost nothing. But if you go through life and you don't know Jesus, friend, you've lost it all. Let's stand together tonight with every head bowed and every eye closed. Hello, friends. This is Brian Pondexter, the pastor of Faith Community Baptist Church, located at 2216 Hennings Road in East Bend, North Carolina. We're so grateful to have you listening to our CD ministry that's been provided as an outreach of our church. It's our desire and focus at Faith Community Baptist Church to preach and teach the whole counsel of God to a lost and dying world, to equip the saints of God for service, and to encourage the elderly and shut-ins who cannot attend services due to physical ailments. We meet every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. for Sunday school for all ages, and our Sunday school hour is followed by our worship service at 11 a.m. with old-fashioned singing and preaching from the Word of God. We meet back every Sunday night at 6 p.m. for our worship service. And every second Sunday night of each month, we have what's called an eat and meet service. After our 6 p.m. service, we gather in the fellowship hall for food and fellowship. On Wednesdays, we meet back at the church for our midweek worship service with choir singing and preaching again from God's holy word. Our ladies prepare a meal each Wednesday prior to our service from 5.30 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. I give you and your family a cordial invitation to be with us at any or all of our service times. Above all, you may be listening today, and maybe you've never made a personal commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. Friend, that's the greatest decision anyone can ever make in this life. Too many folks prepare for vacation. They prepare for retirement. They seem to prepare for everything, but sad to say, many make no preparations for eternity. The reality is very clear. We all will leave this world someday, for the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. You must understand that you are guilty before a holy God. Romans 3.23 said, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The prophet Isaiah said in chapter 53 and verse 6, All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. You must understand that your good words, good works and good deeds will not get you to heaven. Isaiah 64 and verse 6 says, But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. Ephesians chapter 2, the Bible said, Therefore by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is, the gift of God. You must understand that you're loved. 
I'm thankful that in John 3 and verse 16, it said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Romans 5 and verse 8 declares, But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You must understand and realize there's only one way to stand right before God. There's not many ways, there's only one. Jesus said in John 14 and verse number 6, He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, the apostles' message was very simple. There in Acts chapter 4, in verse number 12, they said, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. You might ask the question, Preacher, how can I be saved? That's what the Philippian jailer asked in Acts chapter 16, verse 30 and 31. He asked Paul and Silas, he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. Romans 10, 9 said that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. You must ask God to save you. I can't do it. No one can do it for you. Romans 10, 13 said, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you know you're a sinner, and if you're sorry for your sin, and you believe Jesus died for your sins, you simply have to ask him to save you. You might say, Preacher, how can I know for sure God will hear me? Well, first of all, the Bible tells us that we must be drawn. John 6 and verse 44, Jesus said, No man can come to me except the Father which had sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Psalm 51 and verse 17 gives us the attitude we need to have when we come to God. It said there, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O oh God, thou wilt not despise. If God draws you by conviction, and if you're sorry for your sin, you repent of them, if you believe Jesus died for your sins, and if you asked him to save you, then the Bible declares you've been saved. If you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, then you've been forgiven of all your sin. For Romans 8, 1 declares, There is therefore now no condemnation of them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Once a person has been saved, they need to be a part of a fundamental Bible-believing church where they can grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. God calls us out of darkness and commands us to walk in light after we've been saved by his marvelous grace. If we can help you here at Faith Community Baptist Church in any way, feel free to contact us. If you have asked God to save you, please contact us, and we will send you some free literature to help you in your newfound life in Christ. Thank you again for listening to our CD ministry that's been provided by our church here, and may God richly bless you and your family is our prayer.